I'm just going to start it off. It's on Formula One. What will happen over the course of the next 66 laps? Max Verstappen is champion of the world! You've been hearing about F1 too, right? Cool. Let's talk about it. Formula One racing into Miami for the first the time. hottest ticket in town. Hook Tom, drive to survive. Drive to survive. The Netflix drive show is survive. so big. This is a car race at over 200 miles an hour in cities all over the world. Miami Grand Prix, Bahrain Grand Prix, here in Monaco. With insanely famous drivers. Daniel Ricciardo. Lewis Hamilton, seven time world And 100 person teams, racing cars so advanced that they're practically spaceships. And so expensive that they had to make a rule that teams couldn't spend more than $140 million each. And it's only getting bigger. $140 million each is way less than I would have thought. Yeah, that is, that's a lot of money. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. But the logistics and development of the cars alone, I would have guessed, cost that. Or double. Just look at this. This is from a construction camera at one of two new U.S. racetracks. This one's in Miami. This cost $40 million to build, and it hosted nearly a quarter of a million people over three days. Wow. That's a Super Bowl worth of people every day. And one of them was me. It's the first ever Miami Grand Prix. We're racing in the States, and it's lights out. Away we go. This is the coolest thing I just love F1. But a lot of people, because of all this hype, they're hearing about it right now for the first time. And they're feeling a little bit, uh -huh. I don't understand. So let's get into it. This is F1 explained for rookies. What you need to know to keep up with this crazy, expensive sport that everyone's suddenly obsessed with. Lewis Hamilton! I think of all the motorsport related videos I've been recommended for this channel. It's like Isle of Man TT, sidecar racing, rallying, groupie. This is finally one that I'm not completely in the dark about. And it has nothing to do with the Netflix show. I actually haven't watched it. I'm not too big into reality television. But when I lived in Spain, I saw the track in Barcelona because I have a friend who works for one of these companies. But I can't say that I watch Formula One very often. At least through him, I do know where it's going on at any given time. I know he just came back from Bahrain, at least as I record this video. But I hope she gets into the engineering of the cars because I think I'm going to find that most interesting. I could also stand to learn about the point system, which always trips me up with Formula One, and how some of the penalties work. The other day I was watching YouTube Shorts, and it was this, I guess it was taken from an interview with Lewis Hamilton, and he was speaking about G-Force's effect on the neck, and the neck exercises one has to do, and I was thinking, what the? I hadn't even considered it. I'm going to look for that for you and link it in the description. But it's also a look at the bigger question here, the huge question, which is, why do this? Like, why pour so much money, so much technological effort into F1, into People entertainment? The answer is in what we get in return. This isn't just a car race. This is a space program for the road. The general growth in interest. F1's becoming much more of a thing here in the States. The yeah. Monaco Grand Prix! Win the Italian Grand Prix! The Bahrain Grand Prix! If you're new to F1, you might know its American cousins. NASCAR has the least family resemblance. Closed cockpits, oval tracks. IndyCar and F1 look more related. They've got the spaghetti looking track, open cockpits. But there's one they do look really important similar. difference between these two. And it's the reason why F1 specifically is such a big deal. In IndyCar, all of the cars use the same frame or chassis, the DW12. So the competition mm. here is mostly in how you race that car. But in F1, every team has to design and manufacture their own cars. And the best part is that they get to improve the cars between each race, or not, depending on how they do. So the competition in F1 actually centers around the car itself, not just how you race it, but also how you build it and rebuild it again and again and again. This is why I love F1. It looks like the sport of daredevils, but much more than that, it's the sport of nerds. Engineers, data scientists. Okay, each team races two cars, so two drivers for the same team. Each event, or Grand Prix, is three days. Practice, qualifying, and race day. I watch these on TV every time they're on, but this was the first time I ever got to see it in person. Got to see the car up close, that was awesome. 
Now I am inside the Mercedes garage. Truly, she seems so passionate. I have so never passionate. had more fun at a sporting event and seen less of what was actually going on. So right now they're about to do a practice pitch. Here's how this works. The order of who does the fastest lap on qualifying day becomes the lineup at the starting line on race day. And passing isn't easy, so the where you start is a really big deal. Depending on where drivers finish, they get different numbers of points. Okay, so first place is 25 points, second is 18, third is 15, decreases from there, and then 10th place only gets one point. Or 10th place, no points for you. Not so for you. Drivers want to get the most points themselves to win something called the Drivers' Championship. But teams want to get the most points total to win the Constructors' Championship. The two championship thing actually kind of makes for funny mismatched incentives sometimes. You can hear it on the radio when teams have one strategy, like they want to let drivers pass each other, and drivers get really mad about that. If he's quicker, we let three. That's very unfair, but okay. But generally, everybody agrees about the big things, which are drivers, race your fastest. Teams, make the best car. I could watch a whole video just on the mechanics because I don't really understand what they're doing, but it is insane how fast they are. All right, here's the fun part. Lego. Lego is here. Hey, kids, look. There's my driver. Hello, Lewis Hamilton. Think of an F1 car like an airplane upside down. Both meant to move as quickly through the air as possible, right? But where an airplane's wings work to lift it up, these cars' wings work to keep it down. Why? Because winning doesn't just depend on going fast. It also depends on keeping control. And that requires a firm grip on the ground. Take a look at the shape of this car. Now watch how the air moves across it. See how some goes above the wing and some squeezes the long way underneath it? That creates a situation where there's higher pressure above and lower pressure below, sucking the car toward the ground. That's actually happening all over the car, not just on the wings. And we could talk for hours about the design features on this thing, how they shape and use the air. Some pull air in through the car to cool it down. You can actually see there's a hole there. I think they're trying to imply that on my Lego model. Some actually let the driver release air, lessening that downward pressure and allowing them to go faster in Drug order to pass. System. Kind of like a Mario boost. <laughs> you can actually hear this in a race. Listen for DRS here. Now, Charles Leclerc is going to have DRS to try and fight it back. Taken together, an F1 car is just a symphony of aerodynamics. I actually got to see them up close and personal when I was in Miami. We're going there. I absolutely did not keep my goal. You can see teams perfecting these cars over the years, understanding the need for wings and adding them and changing the shape Whoa. and pushing our understanding of aerodynamics to shave off just fractions of a second. Hundreds, sometimes thousands of people work on this, all for one team. So, um, how much does this cost? F1 teams don't really want to share the details here, so there's a lot of speculation. But they're also companies, and some of them have to file their financials somewhere. So with a little bit of research into various European countries' reporting requirements, hold on. Dun -dun -dun -dun. Here they are. Annual reports for every F1 team I could find which is actually eight out of 10, so I'm feeling pretty good about it. It's pretty good. As a fan, this is kind of cool. Like, look, this is, this is Toto Wolf's signature. What I learned from all this is that running an F1 team costs anywhere from 95 million to $425 million. Ooh, that's a lot of money. But the year after these were filed, F1 instituted a new rule saying all teams were only allowed to spend $140 million. Um, so these reports are gonna look a lot oh. different for this next coming year. Okay, driver's salaries not included makes way more sense to me because I know the drivers make a lot of money. But $425 million, going from that to only spending 140 million is a big reduction. I wonder what they had to get rid of. Was that because the teams who had more money were doing better? Probably. Oh, good. Still a lot. No matter what, F1 teams spend a ton of money. So what do they make? These reports show that F1 teams make approximately nothing. They, they operate in a deficit? close to break even. 
Red Bull, for example, made 230 million in revenue, and then add these two up, 229 million in costs, and they ended up with approximately 1.2 million in profit. This is in pounds, actually, so that's 1.5 million dollars. These aren't the wildly profitable enterprises I was imagining. So why do they do it? Well, take a look at this. This is the Ferrari annual report. Our brand image depends in part on the success of our Formula One racing team. The racing team it's is a marketing. key component of our marketing strategy. It's advertising. Wow. Advertising. Wow. Advertising. That's a it's great. They use F1 to sell other stuff, whether that's luxury sports cars or a sports drink. Red Bull gives you wings. I mean, as entertainment, F1 is incredible. But a lot of people do feel that it's somewhat wasteful. How much does a Formula One car cost? 400 million. Is it worth all that money? This is bigger than F1. It's kind of crazy to think about how much work we as a species put into entertaining ourselves. But I think what makes F1 feel particularly acute for some people is the technology element here. All of this engineering work and all of this energy being spent on 20 fossil fuel reliant cars makes people wonder sometimes if that energy might be better spent elsewhere. Like literally anywhere else. Well, that argument that F1 is wasteful could be applied to multiple other forms of entertainment then in that case, no? Like, how many Hollywood movies take up large amounts of time and resources for little to no benefit beyond, what, an hour and a half worth of entertainment? And then some movies are remakes, so double, sometimes triple the cost, depending on how many times the movie's been remade for a slightly different version of the same product. Or, this is a tangent now, but I remember a couple of years ago when that last season of Stranger Things was coming out, so many articles talking about how Netflix spent something like $30 million per episode for a season of nine episodes. And then if you reduce that show to what it actually is, it's nothing more than another form of entertainment. No hate to Stranger Things. I did like the first two seasons. But are those budgets the same? No. And is the cost to the environment the same? Likely not. Never looked into it. I'm not saying there's not a problem with any of those. I'm just acknowledging the fact that the same logic could be applied to other forms of entertainment. But yeah, I agree with her. As humans, we do spend a lot of money on being entertained. But F1 is more than just entertainment. It's better thought of actually as one giant experiment. <laughs> I could see that. F1 pushes everything to the extreme. What do you need to create to compete at this level, to keep control at these speeds, to keep the driver safe in these conditions? The idea is that the technology that they build ends up trickling down to all of us non-race car drivers. My question was, is this actually true or does it just sound good? I wanted to find specific car parts that were developed for F1 and then ended up in my car. But the more research I did, the more complicated it got. People often talk about paddle shifters, for example, but those were actually developed decades before F1. F1 teams just made them better. Same for active suspension, anti-lock brakes, traction control. What I found was that F1 was less trickle-down and more flywheel. F1 combines technologies that might already exist and then pushes them to an extreme, making them better in the process and then inspiring, or literally manufacturing, better tech for all of us. For example, take thermal efficiency, the percentage of energy from combustion that actually makes the car go, as opposed to being lost to heat. Most combustion road cars have a thermal efficiency between 20 and 30 percent, which means only a third of the energy actually makes the car go. F1 cars can't refuel during a race, so there's a very strong incentive for them to be efficient. They're at about 50 percent now, thanks to new hybrid engines, gains that have been dragging the rest of the car industry forward. Or data collection. Sensors on F1 cars collect huge amounts of information and then feed it back to the driver and the team. They didn't invent a lot of these systems, but they use them in ways that they've never been used before. And that's actually getting more and more important as we move potentially towards self-driving cars. This is the real mm. promise of F1. And it all stems from that original requirement to build their own cars. Basically, this might be a really hot take, but I do not like the idea of self-driving cars at all. I don't know, weigh in on that. We'll do all of this research and development and we'll create new technologies and also combine all of the cutting edge tech and we'll push it to its limits and develop it further and you don't even need to pay for it. We'll race these things against other groups of engineers doing exactly the same thing 
in this crazy round the world sport that lots of people really love that is actually, at the end of the day, the biggest, most expensive group project science competition of all time. People debate whether or not we should spend money on lots of our efforts to learn. And yet, they consistently push forward both the tech that we actually use and our understanding of the world around us. In this case, it also makes some money and it's fun to watch. I think once you see the promise of F1, it allows you to think differently about lots of things. We need people working far beyond the edge, like pulling forward the limits of what we can do. The question now is what do we need to learn next? If F1 pushes forward car innovation and the future of cars is electric, does F1 need to get more electric too? And if F1 doesn't go more electric, does it get farther and farther from its original promise over time? Less applicable to the technology that we use and more a novelty. Oh, let's go watch those cars that use gas. I don't know. Now you're up to speed. You can watch a race, you can enjoy it with your friends, and you can also speculate, like the rest of us, where it's all gonna go. I'll be watching with you. And I'll be rooting for my favorite team. A more energy efficient version already exists, no? Formula E, I thought fell under the same umbrella. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, the channel is called Cleo Abram, which I'll make sure to link in the description along with the specific video. And I like that she focused more on the science aspect of the sport, just because that's what interests me. But if you have any recommendations for videos that get into the drivers or the rules, let me know the title down below. Like I'd like to learn more about the penalty system, not the monetary penalties, like when they have to pay more so the time penalties or drive-through penalties. Whenever I hear them say that, I think, whoa, still have no idea. <laughs> so if you have any information to add to this video, feel free to do that. I think it was really well edited. Her passion translated, <laughs> which made it fun to watch. So I actually don't have a book recommendation for you today. I haven't read anything even near the subject of Formula One. So if you have books that you want to recommend to each other, feel free to do that. No music recommendations for me today. I'll make sure to put extra in the next video. That's really it. So leave your thoughts. Thank you for watching with me and I'll catch you next time.